Okay, so good morning everybody and welcome to the Center for Theoretical and Computational Physics weekly seminar. Today it is a pleasure to welcome Ricardo Henriques from Institut Gulbenkian de Ciencia in Oeiras near Lisbon. Now Ricardo started out in physics, he did his first degree at TAFCU, the Faculty of Sciences at Lisbon University. This was followed by an internship at Institut Gulbenkian de Ciencia and a PhD at Institut, Institut Pasteur in, in Paris and the Institute for Molecular Medicine of Lisbon University. After a short postdoctoral stint, he got a permanent position at University College London and most recently he uh, started his move back to Institut Gulbenkian de Ciencia where he will be a group leader applying uh, physical techniques to study uh, cells. And this is what he kindly agreed to tell us about today. His research is also funded by a European Research Council uh, grant. So just before I hand over to Ricardo for the truly interesting stuff, just uh, a few uh, announcements from me. First, uh, this seminar is being recorded. So the seminar is being recorded. So by staying on, you're agreeing to your voice and image being recorded and uh, stored online. Uh, and in the interests of internet stability, can I ask all of you, except the speaker, of course, to mute yourselves and turn off your cameras during the seminar. If you wish to ask a question, then you're of course free to unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera if you so desire. So without further ado, let me now hand over to Ricardo for the, uh, for the seminar proper. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's, um, it's actually a pleasure to, to be talking with you because um, I actually originally came from, from school. Uh, so it is, is actually my first talk back to the place where I first trained as a physicist. Um, so my seminar today is about the work that we've carried out to, to make uh, open technology and microscopy to study cell biology. And everything that you're going to see today is meant to be as successful as it can be. It's not only inexpensive, everything is open source and everything is transparent in terms of bringing it on to um, a biology lab and exploiting what it can do to allow you novel observations on cellular behavior and cellular mechanisms. So I was here at school at in the, about in 2000 or so, uh, and it was f a fun time because in reality I trained as a, a, a physics engineer and I knew nothing about uh, cell biology then. Um, I knew a little bit by biophysics, uh, but what I really wanted to become at the end was a quantum and particle physicist. And that changed a little bit uh, over time. Uh, at the end of my graduations, uh, at the time it was a licenciatura, which meant that you, we had the opportunity to do a one year internship in an institute. And my choice at the time was the Copenhagen Institute. Um, and there I, I, there I shot a laser through a microscope for the first time. And that was what got me. I, I decided that I wanted to explore that. And I started going more into optical physics and, and exploring optical physics to go into biology. Funny enough, now we're starting a lab back at the Gulbenkian Institute, which is pretty much the first institute where I did research at the end. Um, as you've been told, I, I did a short, uh, I did a post, a PhD at the, the IMM and Institute Pasteur, and from, followed up uh, with a postdoc at Pasteur. Um, then in about 2013, I was invited to start a lab at UCL, at University College London. Uh, in the UK, and then also we created a second lab at the Francis Crick Institute, uh, which is just next to St Pancras in London also. So, so that's a little bit of, of my progression. Let me tell you about the, the, the science that we do. And I always like to go back to, to these experiments because I kind of know exactly the moments that I wanted to become an academic researcher. And, and it's these is 
something that happened when I was about 15 or so. So when I was a kid, I, I was invited to, to come to a lab and there was a simple question of, here's a laser beam, here's a slit, can you tell me what happens next? Um, so I didn't know much, uh, but I knew a few things. At the time I had this, it's already this concept that um, uh, light was composed by photons and that those photons will have some momentum uh, attached to them. So I thought of them as ping pong balls, right? So, so aperture, ping pong balls, a direction in which they're going. There's what I think is going to happen is that these ping pong balls are going to collide with the sides of that aperture. They're going to go through the hole. So what I thought is I'm going to get a shorter beam out of it. And so we, we did the experiment and we filmed it. Uh, and what I saw blew my mind because it's exactly the opposite to what I was expecting. And, and how amazing is this, right? The, the, it's, it's, I, I couldn't really imagine it at all. And, and for me as a kid, this was magic. I, I couldn't really understand what was going on and everything in my mind was telling me this is impossible. But look, as we close down that aperture, you, you get exactly the opposite, right? You get this elongation laterally, and, and you get these side loops uh, appearing. So, you know, what you're seeing is, is the wave nature of, of light coming across. And, and this is the very basic principles of diffraction. And this was so disruptive to me that I pretty much decided to spend my entire career studying it. Now, flashback a few years for, forward, and I started using microscopes. And guess what you have on the microscope? Whenever you're trying to look at a fluorescent molecule, like what you're seeing there, that's one of the most used molecules in biology, GFP. You can think of it as a point source of light. And those photons that are going to be emitted by that point source of light will have to go to an objective. And the first thing that they find in the objective is this aperture. Now, this aperture is a little bit different from what you saw before, because before you were looking at the linear slit, now you actually have a circular aperture. And because you have that circular aperture, what you get out of it is actually a diffraction pattern that is radially symmetric, because your aperture is circular. So for each point source of light that we try to, to observe, we get exactly the same diffraction pattern that you saw before, except that now it's radial instead of being in a single direction. And this actually boils down to the resolution limits that you get when you try to use an optical microscope. Because every molecule that is emitting light that you're trying to see gets that pattern uh, out of it. That means that if you're trying to look at something inside a cell that is composed by millions of molecules that are all compacted together, all those point patterns will uh, overlap with each other and will blur out the information that you're trying to resolve. And the example that I'm going, uh, giving you here, for example, is a mitochondria. Uh, and this mitochondria is about 500, 500 nanometers. And because of this blurring effect by diffraction to get, to get on the microscope, the optimal, the best resolution you can get at the end is about 300 nanometers, which is not enough to see internal structure. So when, when I started my PhD, uh, there was a new field that was just blooming, and that's called super resolution microscopy. And super resolution microscopy was pretty much using a series of concepts in optical physics to try to improve resolution uh, beyond this limit imposed by diffraction. And then I ended up using uh, and extending one of the most popular super resolution methods that I'm going to tell you the principle uh, right now. So imagine that you're trying to get this mitochondria, but the thing is we can actually now decorate that mitochondria with molecules that you can control their emitting states. You can, in a light mediated manner, turn them off and turn them on. If you're able to do so, what you can actually do is you can turn off all the molecules that are emitting in your sample, and these can be done by a laser, just a particular wavelength. And then you only turn on, again, by a different wavelength in the laser, you only turn on a very small subset of molecules. And now what happens when you turn on the very small subset is that the information that you have there, it's much simpler than having those millions of molecules all emitting simultaneously. And it's so simple that you know exactly how the point pattern of each molecule should look like, which means you can fit the model to it and detect and localize those molecules. 
What do we do after? Well, we turn off these molecules, turn on a different subset, detect and localize, and if you cycle through a few uh, thousands to millions of images, you can actually capture the vast majority of molecules that have turned on and off, which will recapitulate their location within the uh, um, cellular object that you're trying to observe. What you get at the end is actually an estimate of the underlying ultra-resolution structure of the biological object that you're trying to uh, image at the end. And you do so with a resolution that is about tenfold higher than what you would get on a microscope impacted by the diffraction limit. And this is really interesting because these kind of experiments where you're simplifying the information that you have, like what you have here, and you're just looking at diffraction patterns, it's quite similar to what we do in astrophysics. Uh, because what we're trying to do in astrophysics on images from telescopes is exactly the same thing. We're trying to look at the point patterns that actually come from stars and planets in the sky. So the, the first paper that I had that kind of defined my career, which is called Quick Palm, is actually a paper where I create a non-algorithm to do these points pattern detections. But in reality, what I did there is I translated an algorithm from the astrophysics that was developed in the 70s to be applied to biology. And many things that I've done throughout my career has been very much on the mindset of bringing concepts that are really mature in physics into a completely new application in biology. So here's four kicks. Um, the, one of the beauties of physics is that it's universal. The same laws that a microscope has to obey in terms of diffraction are the same laws that a telescope has to obey when uh, it's looking at the diffraction of stars. And I was doing uh, a large part of this research when I was back in Paris. And one day I was invited to go have a picnic in front of the Eiffel Tower. And the funny thing about the Eiffel Tower if, is if you go there at night uh, and uh, you go there at uh, the exact hour, the Eiffel Tower will do this. It will, will, will randomly blink its lights for about five minutes. And I remember when I uh, was in that picnic, I, I was kind of pissed off to, to, to see this. Uh, because, you know, I was spending eight hours in front of a microscope trying to get it to work uh, for a cell and I really didn't want to see it again in uh, my free time. But the funny thing is, again, physics is universal. So the same laws that exist on a telescope or a microscope are the same laws that exist in the objective that I have on my mobile phone. So what I did here is I just collected a movie of the Eiffel Tower and the same point patterns detection algorithm that I could use on a telescope or a microscope, I could actually use it on the phones to super resolve uh, the Eiffel Tower. So that's, that's a macro scale structure, but let me show you a little bit about what you can do in a cell. Um, so this is what we would observe uh, before super resolution would be invented. Uh, so here, what we're trying to understand is we, we for instance, we labeled two molecules. Um, one is called LAT, one is with, uh, called SWIP75. We labeled one with green and we labeled one with red. And we were trying to understand if these two molecules interacted with each other. And generally, that's as simple as asking, do I see them overlapping? Uh, and green over red gives you yellow. So this cell appears to be yellow. So it seems that those two molecules interact all throughout the membrane, which is what we're trying to see now. But again, you, you have to understand what's the resolution that we have here. Um, uh, this first image that I'm showing you, it's, it's, it's a classical optical microscopy image. So it's resolution limited to about 300 nanometers. But these molecules are about two to five nanometers in size. So that's the same thing as me trying to infer if two people uh, are sitting together in, with an error as big as an entire auditorium itself. 
And this is where resolution improvement starts to become a little bit more interesting because if now I switch this to a superposition image, what you see is that these molecules actually form some territories at the surface of the membrane of a cell, but those territories are almost always mutually exclusive. They're next to each other, but they do not overlap. And because of that resolution loss that you saw before, uh, imposed by diffraction, you couldn't really perceive that information. And it's really interesting because now we have about 20, 30 nanometers resolution, which is much better than what we could do before. But it's not enough yet, because as I told you, these molecules are two to five nanometers. So we're, we're, we're much more precise and accurate in trying to determine the territories that they occupy and these interactions, but there is still a considerable error attached to it. All right, so that's what I did during my PhD and postdoc. I really wanted to develop these uh, technologies, resolution microscopy, and apply them to, to really understand some of the mechanisms behind cellular behavior. And in 2013, I, I equipped with super resolution, uh, I started my lab, and I really wanted to, to use super resolution to see small scale objects and uh, that's determined biological behavior, which you can really see through super resolution and where conventional optical microscopy could not really resolve. And that's the case, for example, for viruses, vesicles, and small protein complexes. To give you a, a sense of this, uh, well, it happens that all mammalian infecting viruses, uh, all that we know, uh, including COVID, uh, influenza, uh, HIV, uh, pox, they're all of sizes, uh, about, well, the biggest one is about 400 nanometers and the diffraction limits on optical microscopes, it's about 300 nanometers. That means that you can't really see an individual virus or its internal structure in the conventional microscope and you need to start using these techniques to really understand how they work. So we've started supplying these techniques to study a little bit viruses like HIV, what you're seeing here, which, which allows us, for example, to actually, uh, in the living cells, to, to really understand how the viruses infects and then it goes through processes such as viral uncoating and viral self-assembly and morphogenesis. And uh, for example, the images that I'm seeing you here is, is this capsid shape that you see inside HIV, which needs to, to disassemble in order for the virus to integrate. We uh, are actually able to see the, the disassembly process uh, resolving the capsid within the cytoplasm of a cell and then starting to uncoat, bringing the viral genome into the nucleus of the host cell where it will integrate these information to form new viruses. This beautiful sun explosion type image that you see here is actually a molecule of the virus once it's crossed the nuclear membrane that it starts to accumulate in the inner envelope. And these, these kind of sun explosions that you see is actually uh, this molecule crossing the nuclear pores that the virus has to get, that the cell has uh, in the nucleus in order for the virus to get its proteins inside the nucleus. And it's really cool, you know, we, we can uh, now not only super resolve these viral structures, but also uh, super resolve the viral, the host cell components that the virus needs to interact in, in order to, to really infect cells, to get inside and to start replicating also. So, so that's what we're equipped with, but there's a few things that we need to, to do to get this to work. It's not only about having an algorithm, you need to also have these kind of molecules that are able to uh, switch between on and off states, emitting and non-emitting states. Generally, this is done by bombarding certain uh, fluorescent molecules with high intensity lasers, which will preempt these blinking events that you have. And one of the things that uh, we wanted to do is try to get rid of those that need for high intensity lasers because that's actually quite damaging for a living cell also. Uh, so we were wondering, can we make such molecules uh, that blink in, in, a completely, uh, in a way that is completely independent of illumination itself? And the trick is that we found was, let's use DNA. So, so this is a DNA strand that we've uh, engineered to make this hairpin structure. 
And, and what you have here is that uh, uh, at the ends of the DNA strands, the, that DNA uh, hybridizes with itself, forming these, these hairpins. And what we do is we actually put a through four and a quencher just next to each other at the ends of the DNA strand. That means that the quencher, when it's uh, next to the through four, it prevents the through four from actually emitting light. But if this stem part of the DNA actually uh, um, uh, denatures by uh, thermodynamics, for example, what, what you get is that the DNA will be able to freely um, uh, untangle, uh, allowing the through four to get away from the quencher, which means that now the through four is allowed to emit light. Cool, so we can actually play with thermodynamics here, right? Because what we can do is we can actually engineer this structure in a way that at whatever temperature we want to image, there's going to be a likelihood that you'll have molecules that are in an open state, therefore allowing the flow for to emit, and some molecules that are going to be on a closed state. And this is reversible for each molecule and it's completely transient and stochastic, which means that pretty much these molecules naturally blink. So the way that we characterize them is we started tethering them to a cover slip, putting them on a microscope, and here's what we actually see, right? They, they naturally start emitting light. And this is completely independent of the illumination that you put on the microscope. I'm going to chemically arrest them, uh, arrest them in a way that I'm going to enforce them to open up so that they constantly emit so that you see where they are. And I'm going to do that by adding formamide, which you're going to see about now, right? So suddenly you see all the molecules appearing because I've enforced a single state, which is the open state. And here's, for example, what happens for, for three molecules uh, that I'm showing on that cover So you get blinking before I add formamide, and I, I add hot formamide, which enforces the open state. The molecules then constantly emit until they bleach out, which means that they are destroyed at the end. Cool, so that means that we actually were able to develop a new kind of microprobe that is able to blink and therefore we can actually use it for subresolution imaging at the end. So, so that's a little bit of uh, what we started doing, right? We developed some of these probes uh, using thermodynamics and, and uh, chemistry to, to design them uh, and we started studying how viral infection worked. And sometime during my, the beginning of my position as an independent researcher and group leader, uh, I wrote a few grants to get a little bit of funding. And here's some of the feedback that uh, I had. From Human Frontiers, this would be a great project for Cryo EM from the MRC, uh, which is a UK funding agency. Super resolution in general should be seen at face value as, as a sophisticated way of analyzing blobs that can only be complementary to high resolution electron microscopy. Rough feedback uh, and, and really got me angry for a few days, but there is a huge ground of truth there, which is we pretty much are using a presence microscopy technique to improve resolution, but there is an alternative method, electron microscopy, which has been able to do so for decades. And, and then the question becomes, what can I do with super resolution fluorescence microscopy that I couldn't do before with electron microscopy? And when the fields in super resolution started, there, there was a lot of promises here that we would discover uh, new structures that had never been seen, but there hasn't been that many. Many of the things that we've looked at uh, and started describing by super resolution, they had in some ways already been seen by electron microscopy. So, so what's unique about super resolution? Well, one of the things that is unique is the fact that it can be live cell compatible. While electron microscopy, unfortunately, to date, there is no way that you can see a living sample there. So, so that means that these new fields is not necessarily about seeing something that we had not seen before. It's actually about understanding its dynamics and its behavior beyond what any other method uh, is able to do. And this was a little bit actually of a challenge. So when I had this criticism, I, I was annoyed, but then I thought, well, that means that the big knowledge gap that we have here and where I should be exploring is live cell imaging, but there's a problem. 
which is these open source methods that just appeared. And my favorite one is Palm Storm. It's the, the technique that I just showed you before, where we're turning mocks on and, uh, and off. There, what's happening is that we're generally reusing high intensity illuminations to, to drive those blinking events. And we're actually swapping two dimensions. We're, we're, we're improving spatial resolutions by losing temporal resolution. And what I mean with that is that now we actually need to acquire a sequence of images in time to generate a single high resolution reconstruction at the end. So we're, we're, we're really losing resolution in time in order to improve that resolution in space. So th this is a major issue, right? Because here, here's a technique or it's, here's a realm of techniques that is really compatible, potentially compatible with live cell imaging, but, but there's all these limitations that prevents you from properly doing it, right? Because if you want to look at the living cell, you need to acquire those images fast and you, you really need to use more illumination because otherwise you're going to photo damage that sample. So this is the issue, right? This is the kind of images that we try to acquire for, for single molecule super resolution, where we then detect and localize all those reports that are blinking. And in reality, what I want to do is Instead of using images like this, what I really want to do is, in a very high speed, be able to collect a very small amount of images, which are acquired when I use very low illumination in my sample. So the question is, can I, instead of using images like this, use images like this? And, and there you're just using, looking at 100 frames acquired at 100 frames per second, it took me a second to acquire those frames and 40 milliwatts per square centimeter, so that you know uh, that's the illumination that you use in the lowest power microscope, Francis microscope you probably have in a lab. So can I increase resolution in these images? Um, maybe I can. Here's, here's a few things that we know. First, we know that if we have a point source of light, as I showed you in the first slides, uh, I'm going to get uh, a point pattern that is radially symmetric because I'm using a circular aperture in my objective, right? And I also know that a fluorescent molecule is not perfect. And by not perfect, what I mean with that is that it does not emit a constant flux of photons. This is because there is thermal unbalance in them. That means that their, their structure it is not, uh, uh, it's not a crystal, it's not robust. Uh, it, it fluctuates in terms of its structure. And because it fluctuates, it means that also the outputs of its photons will also fluctuate. Uh, it has collisional quenching with oxygen. It has homofred happening with its partner uh, molecules. So there's many things that are affecting the efficiency of the fruit for willing that fruit for to oscillate uh, its intensity. And if the sample is, it's decorated with fruit force and they oscillate, that means that sometimes you'll have especially a fruit for that emits brighter than any other fruit for in its vicinity. And if it does so, it will show that point pattern that uh, you saw before, a little bit brighter than any other point pattern that you'll have. And okay, if I use this as a principle and start just asking in space, where do I actually have something that looks like those point patterns? And I'm doing that by actually asking which regions of space have a high degree of radial symmetry. What I get is what you see there on the right. And pretty much that radial trans uh, symmetry transform is mapping, is trying to map uh, every time that you have a fruit for emitting slightly brighter than anything else in this vicinity. So you get that thinking that you have. But it's, it's also error prone, prone because you know, any, any texture that you have on your image that shows some degree of radial symmetry will give you this false impression that there might be blinking coming in for a fruit for. And you see that a little bit on this video here, there's this region there that actually doesn't have any fluorescent molecule. And you see some, some stochastic blinking on the background. And that happens because you know, noise in, in the completely fortuitous manner will have some degree of radial symmetry from time to time completely by accident. So what else do I know? Well, one other thing that I do know is that noise is uncorrelated in time. That means that the intensity that you get on a pure noise pixel 
on a certain moment in time has very little to do with the signal that I have for that same noisy pixel some in some other moment in time. But the oscillations that I actually have on those through force are self-correlated. That means that they kind of actually have a voice to the way that they, they oscillate. So if I just start actually applying uh, autocorrelation transforms into the data that you have here, what those autocorrelation transforms are going to do is actually they're going to raise up wherever I have specially correlated or temporally correlated information, uh, which actually corresponds to true flow for location and to, to structure. Uh, and anything that is uncorrelated, like backgrounds, actually gets dampened down. So great. Uh, that means that, you know, out of just 100 frames, the images that you see on the left, I immediately start getting a super resolution image out of it. And the beauty of it is that we're just using maths, right? We're just using physical uh, properties on the, the data, uh, on the data we are collecting. And that by itself is able to allow you to bypass the resolution limits that you have on the microscope. So why, why is this interesting? Well, if you're actually looking at a fixed and dead cell, uh, you don't really care. And by the way, uh, the methods, these methods that we've created, pure, which is pure mathematical, is called SURF, so, which stands for super resolution radio uh, fluctuations. So if you have a very dead and fixed cell, you don't really care because you can take as much time as you want to create a, a super resolution reconstruction of, of your data. You can acquire millions of, of images with really single molecules blanking there and, and use a maximum micro estimator, which is the best type of algorithms for this uh, and gets the best possible resolution. But for a living cell using 10,000 fold less illumination than what you, you would classically use for other super resolution methods, you get something like this, right? On the left is the image that you get from a normal microscope. And on the right is the image which we, the images that we are processing through the surf technique that we created, which is already giving us about a three fold improvement in the resolution that you have. And the nice thing is that, you know, we're continuously imaging these cells for 30 minutes and there's no, uh, no visual distinction of, of problems like photo bleaching or photo damage in the cell. It's a, it's a happy cell doing whatever it needs to be doing. And that's really cool. If you want to know a little bit about it or see where we've applied it, there's, there's a couple of papers that we got recently in case you want to see some of the observations and discoveries we've uh, had with, um, with this approach. So, um, so that's the conundrum, right? We, we've developed a really cool method for live cell super resolution imaging. Uh, but there's, there's something really cool about imaging fixed samples that do not move anymore because what you can do there is you can take as much time as you want to recover the information that exists on those samples. And that's where you really get the best possible resolution at the end of the day. So, so can we somehow combine the best of both worlds? Can we uh, image cells live, which will get this dynamic in their behavior, right? Uh, but will be resolution limited because there's only so much time we can take to generate a frame. And can we combine it with a fixed cell that we can take as much time as, as uh, you want? And the trick is, there is, and, and I'll show you how, how we do it. And before doing that, here, here's a bit where I'm actually proud of uh, being Portuguese because all throughout my career uh, in Portugal, if there's one thing I learned was to solve a problem with the, the least amount possible of um, economical resources. So for this, we actually used Lego. So what you're seeing here is actually a syringe pump array. Uh, so on top, you're seeing eight syringe pumps and inside the microscope, so this is the microscope, this is an incubator, there's a small syringe pump there. And what the syringe pump array does is it mimics all the experimentation that you would use in the lab to fix a cell sample and then to fluorescently label it. So that means that you know, we can actually do a chemical experiment in the sample as we image it in the microscope. Uh, 
And the cool thing about Vego is that it's pliable. The, we, we can change the, this configuration and rebuild something that is completely adapted to uh, the experiment we want to do. So what are the experiments we want to do? I'll give you a few examples. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by looking at the dynamics of a protein that is called actin. Actin composes the, the, the kind of the skeleton of a cell. It's responsible for giving it its shape. And I'm going to start by observing that cell alive and, and looking at dynamics of, of that cell. And I'm just going to show you in the beginning that, that's, uh, that cell as seen by a conventional microscope. And then I'm going to improve the resolution a little bit by applying the surf methods that we've developed. But at a certain moment, I'm going to switch into uh, a, a much higher resolution image. And that's because on the back of it, what you have is that we've triggered that syringe pump array to fix the sample, label it, and then we've taken about an hour to take the final image that you're seeing. So here we go. The living cell, the actin cortex dynamics. I'm going to switch to surf. That gives you about a threefold improvement in resolution on what you see now. And now this final image that you're seeing appearing there took us about an hour, right? And you have a tenfold improvement over what you had before. But now it's a fixed sample. You don't have temporal dynamics anymore. So that means that you know, we now can leverage the penalties we have here. We can get information in time, but with only mild improvement in resolution in space. And then we take a major penalty in time because we have a fixed sample and we take as much uh, improvement in resolution as we can take. But the funny bit is that now that we have a fixed sample, there's so much we can do also because with the same data set, I can actually now go there and label for a protein uh, super resolve it, strip out those fluorescent labels, label for a different protein, uh, super resolve it, strip out, label, strip out, label, strip out, label, strip out. And I can go on and chemically label as many molecules in the cell as I want. Now I'm actually theoretically limited because I use the clinging at the same cell on the microscope and just doing chemical experimentation over it. So <laughs> the nice thing about it is that, look, it, it's, it's so simple that a 14-year-old can build it. Uh, and uh, there's a, uh, an enormous number of different labs across the world that started building their own version of this syringe pump uh, array, which, by the way, has the nickname of uh, Pumpy Pump Face. So that's a little bit of uh, what we've done. So, so I told you about some of the maths that we've done to improve the resolution, some of the biochemistry that we've done generating a new type of uh, probes that use thermodynamics to, to, to generate these uh, uh, blinking states. I told you a bit about hardware that we've done also. So I want to finish up by telling you a little bit about machine learning. So machine learning is really interesting right now in microscopy. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's so interesting is that it's pretty much outperforming almost any other methods that has been deployed to do image analysis. Um, and there's been a boom in the last three years where there's an increasing number of papers uh, really demonstrating that the machine learning can be enabling in terms of retrieving quantitative information from uh, bio, uh, uh, biological images. And I, I got interested in machine learning because of this, because uh, one of the things that we've started working on with colleagues is on the noising data. And the noising data is really important for live cell imaging because light is damaging to cells. Um, so if you really want to look at a living cell for a long period of time, you really need to reduce the amount of illumination you put into it, which means that at the end you're really looking at very noisy images. So can we denoise that information? Can we recover back uh, meaningful information out of it? And machine learning is actually a great way to, to do it. But also, most researchers in life sciences and most biologists don't really have easy access to, uh, to machine learning. And there's two reasons behind that. And I'm going to tell you a bit what those reasons are. But before doing that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how deep learning and machine work, learning generally works in microscopy. 
I'll start with a classical home algorithm, which is not machine learning based, right? So on the classical, let's say a classical denoising algorithm, what you have is that you have some kind of input image. You have a predefined algorithm that was developed by someone using some, some prior knowledge about the noise characteristics of the system that you're trying to observe. Uh, you might optimize some parameters on that algorithm and then you will get uh, an image out of that. But the, the thing that you need to keep in mind here is that that algorithm is predeveloped, is predefined, it has a structure inherited to it, and all that is based on the conception of the developer and its best noise or its best understanding of how that acquisition hardware works. A deep learning algorithm does something a little bit different because what you actually do is you actually give it a series of examples of images that you already have. So, so you already have examples of your input images and how your output images should look like. And you present this to a, to a weakly defined algorithm that actually doesn't have a full internal structure yet. And what you're actually doing is you're asking that algorithm, can you optimize yourself in a way that allows you to translate the images that you see on the left into the images that you see on the right. And you give it all these, uh, these examples. And normally those examples are on the orders of hundreds of thousands of images. And as the algorithm trains and tries to find its internal structure, at some point that optimization converges to, to uh, uh, the best model it can ever uh, achieve. And you get a trained model out of it. And with that, you're actually able to give it uh, an input image. And through that model, it's going to try to predict how the output image should look like, right? So with this, it learns to actually do the noising. But the fact is, because it has a weak internal structure, not only can it do the noising, it can do almost any type of image to image translation you might want. It can actually be, improving the resolution where you show it uh, examples of low resolution and high resolution images. It can be segmentation where you show it an image and an annotated image and it learns how to annotate those images. Um, it can be translating modalities where you can show it a fluorescence image and then the EM image and it will try its best to predict how the EM image should look like from that fluorescence image or vice versa. But to do, to do this, right, the, 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 the issue here is, first, there is uh, uh, the need for know-how on how to use these machine learning algorithms. And, and this is a little bit more complex than using a pre-trained algorithm where, you know, you just run the commands, adapt some parameters, like what you would do classically, because now you actually need to understand how to collect that training data, how the training process works, and how to infer models out of it. And the second thing is that all these deep learning uh, type of algorithms rely on GPUs. And this is because they're computationally heavy and the best way to accelerate the way that you do the training optimizations is by using uh, a high performance graphics card, generally beyond the type of graphics cards that you find in most workstations and computers you have accessible in um, a biology lab. So because of this, we actually developed uh, something that we call zero cost deep learning for microscopy, which is a platform developed from scratch for, for biologists to actually be able to exploit deep learning. And here's how we developed and how it works. The only thing that you actually need is a computer with a browser. The, the computations are actually not done on that computer. They're done in the cloud. The, the only thing that that browser acts as is an interface. And you will also need some, some training data that will train your machine learning algorithm and some new data that you want to exploit. And zero costs deep learning for microscopy and relying it, what it does is it uses some of the services that are provided by Google for free. So it pushes data to a Google Drive uh, service. Uh, so you just need to have a Google account in order to, to do this. And once it pushes the data to Google Drive services, it provides you a user interface, which is agnostic of codes. So it doesn't uh, show the, the end user any codes at all. It just asks what parameters you wanna use. And that's formalized through a Jupyter uh, notebook. 
And that should be learned notebook connects back to, to Google Collab, which is a, a GPU farm that uh, Google has on the cloud. And the Google provides a free GPU to anyone that wants to exploit it. So we actually do the, uh, the network training on uh, through uh, that GPU farm that Google provides and start then doing the predictions, which allows you then to download the train model and the results at the end. So pretty much in order to explore machine learning, you end up just needing a browser, some data, you then use the platform that we've created, zero cost deployment for microscopy, and it takes care of everything else that you see on that pipeline there to then pull back the results that you need. So uh, it's free and it's fully cloud-based. Cloud it uses GPUs that exist on the cloud. Uh, it has a simple user interface, which actually has no coding attached to it. And it's a single platform for uh, training, prediction, and importantly, quality control, because we developed a series of different methods to tell you how good is the data that you're predicting at the end. So, so just to give you a sense of the tasks that this allows you to do, um, it can go from uh, um, segmentations to actually super resolving images. And these are some of the networks that we have implemented. So for example, we have UNETs, which are used to classify data. In this case, for example, it's classifying an EM image to define where the membrane here is. Uh, segmentation. In this case, for example, we are segmenting the nucleus of cells to know where those nucleuses are in space. Um, classification. For example, in this case, we are actually classifying cells that are in different states. Uh, the noising, my favorite bit, uh, where uh, it allows us to acquire images that are really noisy. And this is particularly interesting for live cell imaging. Um, care with the algorithm that you're seeing here in deep learning also uh, the noises and restores some of the data that you have deep storm which makes super resolution predictions out of your data um, as you see here fnet that translates modalities in this case we just have a bright field image without any fresnes and we're predicting a fluorescence image there that isn't seen, by the way. Uh, this is also two fresnes images. One of them is actually never seen, and it's just a neural network predicting what that missing um, image should look like. And Psychogan that also does super resolution uh, predictions. Cool. So uh, zero cost deployment for microscopy exists on GitHub. It's it's freely available, and and you know it's really meant to be super easy to to use. And there is a bunch of um, different labs in across the world that. Uh, are using it now. So if, if this is interesting to you, it's easy for you to, to give it a shot um, also. All right, last but not least. Um, so machine learning is really cool. And a lot of what we're going to do in the future is going to be machine learning based, but there is limitations to what you can do with it because you're kind of biased by your training data. You, you have to have a lot of prior information about what type of, of information you want to retrieve. Uh, give that as a priority to, to the, the, the neural network in order for it to do um, those predictions. There is something much better at doing that, uh, and that's our brain. Uh, but if we really want to explore our brains to the classification of data, we need to have ways that presents that data to our brains in a way that uh, really optimizes our capacity to re recover biological patterns. And that's what we started doing with augmented reality, which is what you're seeing here. In this case, for example, we're starting to use um, uh, uh, augmented reality and VR to, to allow users to easily classify and segment data that you have from, uh, from these kind of point patterns um, that are collected in super resolution imaging. And, and those, those, these data are just points in space. And, and for example, you can immediately see that your brain is really good at saying, well, those points in space are actually filament, and I see some continuity in that filament. And, and that's the, the awesome thing about us being humans. We're, we're still the best performing pattern recognition machine that we know of. Um, so if we, can't, uh, if we can't exploit that with augmented reality, there's a huge amount of information that we can recover back from, from biology. All right. One of my last slides, I wanted to finish up with, with an end message. Um, this is our eye, and our eye sucks. Um, 
it really sucks because throughout evolutions, uh, there, there's a, a series of errors uh, that we ended up with uh, with our eye design. So one of the biggest errors is that you have all these vas vasculature in front of your retina, right? So, so you have your these optical sensors that, that have an object in front of it that is distorting um, the image that you get at the end of the day. And you even um, have a blind spot caused by the optical nerve uh, in, in your eye. And the thing is, we're stuck with this. Uh, there's not going to be a single gene or a two gene mutation that is going to change the, the, the overall architecture that we have in our eye. You know, as long as we're humans, this is what we have. There's no way we're going to escape it. But there's something beautiful here, which is our visual cortex actually fixes analytically most of the problems that we have with our vision. And, and uh, it does it beautifully. And if you, if you really don't have a grasp of this, uh, there's a simple experiment you can do, which is get drunk. If you get drunk, you're going to see all the computational power that your brain has over your eyesight being shut down. So, so as you get um, a drunk, one of the first things that you will see is that you will have uh, double vision. And that double vision comes from the fact that you actually have two images coming from both eyes that need to be registered over each other. And that registration is now gone. And then if you get a little bit more drunk, the next thing that you're going to see is that, your, your, that those images start to wobble uh, a little bit. Um, and that's really cool because, you know, if you grab your phone and look at the video and move the phone like this, you're actually going to see that the image on your phone moves with the phone, right? But if in, in your head you go like this, the image that you see does not move. And that's because that image is aligned with the gravity axis of the planet through your internal ear. Get drunk, that's gone. And the most beautiful thing happens when, when you're really, really drunk, which is that blind spot, which you don't know about, right? You have blind spots that you don't fully realize. And that's because your brain is inferring the data that is missing on that blind spot. As you get drunk, you're going to see it, which means your brain is not able to infer the data that should be on that blind spot anymore. And here's what happens. In microscopy, we're pretty much at the limits of the physics of glass that we, we know. There really hasn't been any disruptive change in, in the way that we build an objective in the last 80 years or so. There's, there's some things that are still left to do and there's work happening in meta lenses, for example, but really for the last decades, we haven't really been surprised. But the nice thing is that what we can do in terms of extracting more information beyond using the limits of physics and, and, and really blowing up those limits purely computationally, is amazing. So, so if you're a physicist and you're interested on the computational side of physics applied to real world observations, this is really hot right now. And it's something that you should really consider uh, getting into because there's so much to do. All right, and in that note, if you're ever curious uh, about uh, our lab, we just started recently and we are hiring. We're always welcome anyone that wants to come for uh, an, an internship or to spend some time uh, with us to do a PhD or a postdoc. And with that, I am happy to take any questions you may have. Right, so thanks Ricardo for a truly mind blowing seminar. And we already have one hand raised. Nuno, ask your question. Okay, so Ricardo, thank you very much for your talk. I have two questions indeed. So the first one is a, is a specific one about the machine learning uh, uh, thing that you were talking about. And you said that uh, you're, you, you have everything in the cloud. So I imagine that you are using images from other users in order to train the network and using always the same network for all the cases, right? The deep learning network. So my question is, do you need to train a network for each specific system? Or the idea is to combine images from different systems to train a more general network? 
And if anyone has looked as how the, the capability of making predictions or, or improving your images scales with the number of different systems that you consider. So if you get to a certain point where the more systems you take in, the worse you get in terms of the answer. The second question is a more general one. So I, I found it very interesting to go to the nanometer scale. And one of the, the things, as you explained it, for, for this optical or from these uh, microscopic resol uh, super resolution techniques is really to follow the dynamics. So I do understand that the cell as a whole is quite robust in terms of mechanisms to any external perturbation or these type of perturbations. And so you are not probably affecting the dynamics of the cell. But do you expect these techniques to affect the behavior at the nanometer scale? In other words, so when you make this intervention in order to make the measurement, you might be affecting what you want to measure. Does it make sense or not? Or if you have any thoughts about that? Thank you very much. So very two good um, questions. Um, so the first one, actually the first one, it's one of the biggest dogmas that exists um, in the field right now. Um, because so your question is, you know, can, can you have a universal model where you've acquired uh, a lot of data and at some point you're not able to, or, or you don't need any more to, to train the neural network to the data that you have? And my personal answer is no. You always have to train on the type of data that you're trying to acquire. And, and there's a problem right now, which is um, researchers are starting to build what is called a model zoo. And, and that model zoo is kind of them saying, Here's a model that we've trained for a hundred different types of acquisition systems, and it should be generalizable enough to whatever new thing you do. But the fact is that whatever system you, you use, it will always have some small different properties to what the, those models were trained for. So the better way to use neural networks is to leverage the, the best of both worlds, and that's called doing transfer learning. As in what you do is you grab models that were trained in massive amounts of data and you use the network was, that was trained there already to then retrain it for the specific bits of the data that you have there. The way to think about this is like you're using an, optimizing, uh, an optimizer algorithm and that optimizer algorithm always starts with a set of parameters. Transfer warning is that you already are using this preset of uh, parameters that were optimized by someone else but then you're re-optimizing it for the specific uh, data that you're using at the end of the day. So that means that, no, unfortunately, we can't just mine prior data and apply it to something new. We always have to use, we always have to have some notion and some bit of information about what we are trying to observe to then be able to use machine learning to further extend those observations. Did that address your question? No. So the, the second bit is, uh, how much are you perturbing the system uh, when you're doing supervision as you're going to nanoscale and, and I'm trying to alleviate photo damage, for example, but is, is that still not impacting the cell? It is. The, the, at the end of the day, um, everything that we're doing whenever we use microscopy is we're always killing that cell. And, and the, the, what we're always uh, considering is the stress that we are causing is it significant to perturb the, the, the behavior that we want to observe at the scale that will allow us to, to, to get meaningful information or get an artifactual behavior at the end? But the fact is, the cells that that's the majority of us uh, study, they are inside bodies, right? We're talking about, for example, fibroblasts or T cells, or, or they're, they're really not skin cells at all. And, and that means that in terms of evolution, these are cells that never saw light uh, in, in their, their, or haven't seen light in millions of years. And in fact, they actually have uh, mechanisms to, to detect if they're exposed to light, which will uh, allow them to think something is wrong, there is a wound, or, or I, I'm where I should not be, therefore I'm a cancer cell. Uh, and I should self-destroy, self-destruct. And, and uh, so, so we spend our time not only thinking about the optics of things, but also thinking about what are the thresholds that, that these cells are able to tolerate. And we know that we are still stressing them and that we're seeing 
anomalous behavior, but there's always the question of to what extent is this anomalous behavior still okay for us to understand how cells behave mechanistically versus not being able to observe it at all. Uh, so there's always an artifact there. There's always a defect <laughs> there, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, Margarita. Unmute yourself, please. Hey, I have to unmute myself. This is, uh, I'll never get used to this. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Very nice talk. I want to be a little bit, uh, I don't know. Uh, in, in the very last slide, the one but last, you actually uh, mentioned several major challenges, not necessarily related to the applications that you've talked about, which were mainly uh, these observations on, on cells. So one was just hardware, the microscopes, the uh, whatever, and the other one was even more general. Uh, how do you see yourself? I mean, you were, you were, you were more or less telling people or they could go that way, or maybe there were big challenges here. Do you see yourself as a biologist and you really, your main interest is biology or are you more, you don't know what the future may bring? I mean, with your background, uh, do you see yourself doing, I don't know, the revolution in the uh, objectives or even going into these other problems where, oh, well, I wouldn't think of cells. Yeah, so, um... Great question, very great advice, Guy. Um, so, so the essence of, of what we do is um, is technology driven by a biological need. What I mean with that is we try to look at the questions that we cannot address at all because we don't have the technology to make those observations. And what we try to do is to actually push that technology forward. And that's kind of what we've I've showed you a little bit, right? That. White damages cells. Therefore, we have to have probes that blink in a light independent manner. To, we need to have these denoising algorithms. We have to have these better ways to do super resolution. And at the end of the day, what that allows us to do is actually to make observations that were impossible. Understand how a virus self-assembles, how it infects a cell. Now, the interesting thing is the, the, the biological triggers here that's, that leads to the technology development, we always have one particular observation we want to do, but that's almost superfluous because once we build the technology, its application is much broader than that particular question that we have, right? For example, we, we make these questions around HIV. We, we want to see how the virus self-assembles, therefore we build the technology to, to, to do that. But then that is applicable to any mammalian infecting virus on the planet, even the ones that we haven't seen yet. So, so what I see myself doing and what I really like doing is, is really understanding this technology gap that is needed to, for us to understanding biology better and build it so that we can make those observations for the first time. You have not answered my question. Uh, <laughs> see yourself in a always in biology driven types of projects even though they're technological or do you see yourself more in in, in some you know i don't know engineering or even uh, even even design types of environments that was my question or that, was, that was behind my question right so um so what i've decided to do is i mean in your last slide one of the last slides i mean you, you could see different different, I don't know if interests or just challenges or, or, or whatever. So, so Margarita, at the end of the day, what, what you've seen is me applying physics and thermodynamics to, to make biological observations, right? And I've decided to do this in a slightly different manner than what is canonical. I, I've decided to spend my entire career among biologists applying mm -hmm. these physical concepts to, to look at biology, right? So, so then the, the question becomes, are you a biologist or are you a physicist? No, 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 I... Not so much whether you're a biologist, but uh, what really, I mean, I, I know, of course, you, you're quite right. You were, you've been driven by problems in biology, but you mentioned other, other, other major uh, breakthroughs that could be important in biology and they would be typically done outside of a biology lab. That, that was probably what I got from the slide. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, the, 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 I, I think the interesting thing here is that you, you can have biology labs working next to, to sure. computational labs next to mathemat mathematical labs and et cetera. But there's always going to be a problem. And one of the problems is that there is not a common language between that, them, right? And one of the things that's, that I've tried to do throughout my career is actually in my own lab to build that expertise by, build, by having people within our lab, as students that are experts in biology, mathematics, computational uh, sciences, and et cetera. I am at core the physicist, but you know, I depend very much on, for example, postdocs in biology to explore some of the questions we, we want to do. And the nice thing there is that we are so tightly connected that we are forced to have a common language. Mm -hmm. So that means that there are things that I have no clue about in terms of chemistry, in terms of being able to actually myself enact it on it with my own hands, but I have the, the base fundamental understanding of how it works in a way that I can communicate and get that working conceptually. So, so that means that we are able to really push technology and physics within a pers very applied perspective that, that is difficult to do when you're stuck among your own fields with that single vision. Um, it doesn't mean that it did this way to do it. It's just, it's the way that we successfully have managed to, to do so far. And, and that's we still want to, to explore. So, so it's, it's, it's hard to pin it down into a single thing, right? That we want to do, or, or that's we, that I'm advising everyone to explore. Uh, at the end of the day, what I'm saying is that physics is open to drive major challenge in biology. And that is very much from the perspective of enabling observations that were impossible. And this is what very much what we want to go into and what I believe there is space for many researchers to go into also. Yes, thank you. Right, we have a question from Federico now. Hi, Ricardo. Uh, thank you Hi. very much for your excellent talk. Uh, it really, really is wonderful to, to watch you uh, in action. Uh, so it's, it's very good. Uh, as, as I told you, we are using SURF and we are uh, for, for the identification of intermediate filaments in cells, in fixed cells in general. Um, and we are using also for, for uh, the identification of protein aggregates that are actually look like balls uh, by wide field, but then they are actually filamentous too. So it's, it's a very nice tool for, this, for these two settings. I was wondering about the first model that you showed that about the oligo oligonucleotides engineer to, to, to blink. And um, I was wondering if, if such a model could be used uh, in live cells. Do you have any, any idea of uh, possible applications for this model in, in live cells? Um, that's a very good question, Federico. So, so um, the, the, these, um, these oligonucleotides have uh, been one of the most interesting that I've ever done throughout my career, but also one of the most challenging ones. We designed them from scratch in the beginning with, with the idea of, uh, of using them in live cells. And this actually goes back to, to my PhD and an idea that came to my mind during my PhD. The, the thing is, once you have double-stranded DNA on a cell, on a living cell, cells are really good at, at picking that there's double-stranded DNA there and they get scared of it. Because normally double-stranded DNA means you're infected by a virus. So you're going to elicit a huge amount of innate immunity responses from the cell once they find these probes. That, then you actually start to have to play with the chemistry in terms of asking, can I camouflage somehow these probes uh, to the cell? And you know, there, there is left sense DNA and uh, LNAs and DNA methylinations that you can actually use to make the cells less sensitive to, to it. So, so we know a few tricks that can be done there. But then the second challenge comes, these probes are synthetic. How am I going to put them inside cells? And that means that now we either have to use a microcarrier, like a transfection agents, or microinject those cells. So, so at the end of the day, it's actually quite complex to bring them into living cells. And, and we're still trying to figure out a way to do it. Another problem that these probes have is that they're fairly big. Uh, as in, they're, they're about two to three nanometers. And this opening and closing is actually mediated also by how packed the microenvironment is around those cells. 
um, which means that we don't have a very tight control on the photo switching kinetics that they have. And that's something that, you know, we can simulate and modulate the thermodynamics and design the probes for that. But at the end of the day, it's going to be mediated not only by thermodynamics, but the microenvironment that they're in. So it's one of those things that I really want to get them to push them, but, but it's a really complex problem to, to solve and something that we are still very much interested in doing. The, what we figured out so far is that they're actually great probes for expansion microscopy where if you've destroyed the crowding and you just really have a, mostly a small uh, lattice in, in water and there they work perfectly. Uh, but what they should actually be, what we really want to get at the end of the day is to, for them to work well in lifestyle uh, imaging. We haven't been able to, to completely done that well. Uh, one, one more question, if you allow me, please. Um, this uh, zero cost DL for mic uh, um, structure for imaging, how many, how many images uh, do you need as a minimum to teach the system? Depends on what you want to do. If you are looking at, um, at images that contain cells or structures that are metastable, are, are repetitive and always have the same features, then you need very few images. And we're talking about hundreds. If, if you're looking at structures that that's are not stable at all, uh, which means that each image has very little redundancy against each other, uh, then you need, it needs thousands uh, or tens of thousands. Um, so generally, filaments actually work quite well, you know, because they're, they're, they're polymers, they have a persistent length, they, they, they have a, a, a finite size. Uh, you, you can almost, you know, you, you, there's biophysical rules that you can easily apply. And to some degree, what the neural nets are trying to do in terms of if you use them for the noising, or, or super solution is they're, they're in an abstract way figuring out some of the biophysics behind those polymers and then uh, apply them to priors as priors to the images that they're trying to generate at the end. Um, so it's, uh, the easy answer is depends on your sample. Uh, but I think if you apply them to, to meet fibers as you are, uh, it might actually be less images than what you would normally need for something that is uh, really diverse. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Uh, just, uh, congratulations again for your excellent talk. All right. So I don't see any more raised hands now, blue, yellow, or otherwise. So maybe it's time to wrap up. Right. So thanks again to Ricardo for talking to us. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. Everyone. Thank you all for coming. And we'll be back next week. So see you thank then. You. Bye, bye bye. And thank you. Thank recording, you for your recording, help. Also. <laughs> re recording stop.